Good evening. My name is Jim Walsh, and I'm Associate Superintendent in the Finance Area, and I work in the Catholic School Office, so I'm pleased to be with you this evening. Um, I'd like to just open the discussion on school boards, the relationship with the Parish Finance Council and the Pastoral Council by just bringing together um, a, a brief quote that came from the United States Catholic Conference on Bishops back in 2005 as they looked at revitalizing Catholic education. And some of the key things that they mentioned here, of course, is that Catholic schools are a vital part of the teaching mission of the church. It recognizes the challenges that exist in supporting financially Catholic schools, changes in society, public schools, charter schools, competitive factors that also influence decision making, but it actually mobilizes us in the importance of building a future for the young people in terms of our faith, the nation, our contribution to society, and obviously the church. So there's a larger calling, there's an inherent challenge, and it's our opportunity to respond. In the Archdiocese of Boston, just to give you a little overview, um, the Catholic School Office provides leadership, professional development, and support to a network of schools in 144 communities. So we have 41,000 students, 121 schools, two special needs schools, eight early education centers, 80 elementary schools, 30 secondary schools, and there's one K-12 school. Now, of the 121 schools, 86 of those schools are parish schools or archdiocesan related entities, related entities being legal corporations that the archdiocese formed where they still hold corporate reserve powers, but we have actually a separate 501c3 corporation and a board of trustees. The remaining schools are run by religious orders. Um, however, all of the schools in the archdiocese work cooperatively with the Catholic School Office. They come to all of our meetings sheer synergies, best practices, professional development opportunities um, to really do what, what they need to do for the greater good of Catholic education. Across the nation, there's been a number of studies. The University of Notre Dame has a major Catholic education initiative, ACE Consulting, Loyola University in Chicago, Boston College, and the Lynch School of, here in B, at BC. Um, a couple of years ago, they put out some national standards and benchmarks for effective Catholic schools. So there are standards out there that all, of, all schools are grappling with, all schools are aspiring to. And generally, the national standards in, that was written in 2012 talks about our schools as mission-driven schools. It talks about the school program and the effectiveness of our school program and the need to measure and monitor those areas. It defined some key characteristics of all of our Catholic schools. It provided 13 standards in the areas of mission and Catholic identity, academic excellence, governance and leadership, and operational vitality. And there are benchmarks that support each one of those standards. So I'm not gonna get into all of those, but. There are references and resource materials available to you, which I will make available to you on links as well if you need them for further reference. Um, here in the Archdiocese of Boston, we actually have our own Catholic school strategic plan. Um, the Cardinal put out a plan uh, last year through our office, and we have some very similar categories, um, which is geared towards strengthening mission, Catholic identity, and faith formation strengthening leadership and governance, including the role of the school board. Obviously, academic ex excellence, which has been our hallmark. However, it also is something that we have to put at the forefront as, as we look to compete in today's secular society. We also talk about operational vitality and fiscal sustainability. And in, in terms of being a parish finance council member, a pastoral council member, a school board member, um, obviously, I deal with the financial side of the operation, but we have business management needs, the need for strategy, the need for financial performance and how we measure performance. We need to have school advisory boards where we involve the laity to work with our leadership and to do long-range strategic planning, which will help us in both the short and the long term. And then we've also announced a, and put forth a multi-year school planning effort. So I'm going to briefly demonstrate some of these tools to you just to make you aware what we already have out in our Catholic school system and obviously are available to you at the parish level as well. Uh, just quickly, when we work with our school leadership, we talk about three pillars of excellence. 
And those three pillars are Catholic identity and faith formation, academic excellence, and then fiscal viability. And you can see from the use of a Venn diagram, they're not necessarily separate and distinct, they all interrelate. Because a quality Catholic school is a school that has strong faith formation inherent in its academic profiling, and it also needs the financial resources to carry out its mission. So all the work that we do is very much interrelated. In the Catholic School Office, what we provide to our leadership is training and support to ensure that operational vitality and fiscal sustainability so that we have worked a lot with the role of sponsorship, formation, and leadership. So a parish is a canonical sponsor. There's an obligation, as you are here tonight, to be formed in the faith, to be formed in what you're being asked to do as a pastoral council member, as a finance council member, and as a school board member, and to understand the nature of the mission of the parish in its ev an evangelization tool that it all becomes to further the faith. We also have strategies, and we've introduced continuous cycle of school planning. And there are a number of tools that we've also made available to our school leadership, which we uh, have a draft of practices for strengthening Catholic identity and faith formation. We have an academic dashboard. We have a financial dashboard. We have a school improvement and best practice reference and resource materials that we have out on our web that's available to all of our schools at presently. And then we have the school finance budget, planning, and performance measures. And I'm going to show briefly how we use a flexible budget approach, a multi-year planning approach, a per-pupil cost financing strategy, um, how we use our dashboard, and then some of the terminology that we've worked with our leadership and boards in recent years, which talks about terminology such as net tuition revenue, operating performance, enrollment growth, revenue enhancement. So we now have a common language that we use with all of our schools as we actually try to build the future. Sister Pat mentioned this in her presentation earlier, and we've actually done, we do workshops on a regular basis with our parish leadership, our pastors, our principals, and business managers. And one of the exercises we did, as Sister mentioned, began with, you know, could you write down your mission statement? And it's a pretty hard task to do, to write down, even though people, as Sister said, work on it. It's hard to actually articulate but a sound mission statement drives all aspects of your strategic plan. And it should be something that's verbalized, understood, and able to be easily repeated. So as you think about the role of the vision and the mission of the parish, the mission of the school through the pastoral council, and then how the school actually uh, exercises that ministry of education and faith formation, you want to make sure that all of the missionary elements of the parish are woven through the various outlets of the parish and the school. How does it work? Once again, using a Venn diagram, we, the canonical sponsor is the Archdiocese of Boston through the local parish, and we have two consultative bodies, which are the Parish Pastoral Council and the Parish Finance Council. The school board is not a canonical body. It is actually an outlet of the mission of the parish, so that the Parish Finance Council has financial oversight of the school finances. They're not separate and distinct. The mission of the parish pastoral council has an oversight of the school as a mission of evangelization and as the educational arm of the parish. So that there are interrelationships between both of the major two consultative bodies and the school board. And the school board is advisory in nature to the pastor and the principal. So I have another chart to demonstrate that. And on the right side, I just gave you a brief sampling of the school advisory board and then some of the potential subcommittees that are utilized in a format to help advise the pastor and principal with planning. Next slide. So on the left side, um, once again, the, the parish school advisory board, it's an outlet of evangelization and mission. It's advisory to the pastor and principal. However, it can be structured like any sound board to give expert advice, um, help the pastor and principal mitigate the risk in some of the decision ma making, lay out assumptions, analyze trends, plan the future, and it should have representation for both the parish finance council, the pastoral council, the school, and the wider community. So the, the expertise that you're looking for on a school board should come from those major constituencies. And once again, there is an, there is an inherent role of sponsorship to form the laity. 
So when you're asked to be on a board, there should be a formation process on what you're being asked to do, your understanding of your faith, your understanding of the mission of the parish, your understanding of the school, your understanding of the outlets of mission through the pastoral council, because there's truly a formation process and a leadership role that you're asked to share with the pastor and principal. And you offer your advice and expertise through the various subcommittee formats. Some of the suggested subcommittees we use generally are that school boards deal with policy and strategy. They help with revenue enhancement. Um, they work with finance and facilities, development and advancement, public relations and marketing, enrollment management, academic excellence. So that once again, the expertise brought together by the laity to help advise the pastor and principal on behalf of the school, on behalf of the parish, all comes together. So when you look at school leadership from a parish level, a pastoral council level, a finance council level, or when we look at it from a school level, we actually work with our leadership to have basically three forms of leadership. There's spiritual leadership, there's instructional leadership, and there's managerial leadership. Sometimes managerial leadership is the most difficult one because that's the carrying out of all the business and the financial and the public relations and the social media and some of the challenging things that go on in today's society. But at the same time, if you're asked to be on a board, you actually need to make sure that the administrative team has the, has the infrastructure to carry out the needs of the school. So if you're on the finance committee or the development committee or the academic committee or the communications committee, what we try to work with our school leadership is to make them understand that they need to have personnel around them that are competent and as expert as you can within the available dollars because that leadership team is a team that's gonna resource information off to you in order for you to do your planning and your work. So the role of the leadership team actually grows in these environments as we involve boards and more people on our boards because when we're asked to join a board, we're basically we're gonna ask, well, what do you want me to do? And if you want me to be on that committee and offer my advice, I need information in order to help you manage and advise you on where the operation is going. So once again, the leader and the leadership team is like a hub of information for board planning and execution. Some of the major functions of the school leadership team is actually, it's pretty vast when you think about it. So we have advancement, re-enrollment, strategic planning, mission, at PR and so forth, administration, faculty, staff, and the leadership team actually is grappling with all of those issues, both on the parish side as well as on the school side. So as Denise and others, and Trish and others talked about, having a, a combined leadership team of competent people that can help on the various segments of management, administration, it's critical that people are all working on the same data in the same ways with the same basic vision because this is a cycle of management and all these, all these areas, if I took the word leader and leadership team out and replaced it with the word budget, all the resource allocations are also going to all of these outlets of mission and functionality. From the congregation of the of, uh, U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops as well, just another you know, quote not to go through it all, but it really talks about, once again, why we need to have strong, rigorous academics, why we have to be in collaborative partnership with our parents, and how we mutually bring together um, the gospel message, a broad-based curriculum to deal with formation in our own faith, and then also how we work with various religious groups and others that now make up our school composition so that we truly have evangelization taking place in our school on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're also forming hearts and minds 24-7 by the young lives that are being formed from all of the resources, time, and talent, and energies of the parish as a whole. And as we talked about earlier, it does play a critical role in the future of all of our parishes. So when you look at the growth of your parish councils, your finance councils, you need to have segments of younger people who can represent various age groups within your parish and your schools and contribute to the overall life of the parish. So as you look to, once again, evangelize the parish, you can also evangelize within your your own pastoral council and finance councils as you go forward. So we talk about a cycle of planning, so not to go through it all, but we work with our schools 
that it's a continuous cycle that we work with mission and vision. We define their goals and strategies and where they're trying to go. We do SWOT analysis in terms of working with schools to assess their environments, what are their strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunities, and their threats. We work with them on understanding where they fit in the marketplace, what are the competitive factors. We work with them and have them understand a mindset of that you need to learn how to compete. So you don't have to compete against the public sector, but you have to be able to compete in terms of knowing who you are, what you offer, what is your brand, what is your quality, what do you offer as a Catholic school that makes you superior because you're asking families to invest net after-tax dollars in a tuition that they can get for free in a public or charter school setting. So it's important that we be at our very best and work towards what we need on a regular basis. And then the operations and management piece, once again, that's the managerial leadership, and that would involve our governance, our management team, you know, what are some of the partnerships that we have available with our schools or parishes? So we've been able to bring some of our secondary schools into a line with our elementary schools. We've been able to bring some of the colleges to help partner with our secondary and elementaries for resource development, for guidance counselors, for best practices, for curriculum development. And some of the partners that are available to you also bring strength in the marketplace to the average person in the pew because they know that there's a number of people helping you stabilize the future and people want to see a stable uh, school operation, a stable parish operation going forward. So when you have a constituent group of people working with you, it obviously helps you with resource development that you cannot normally pay for on your own. And then, of course, we have to back all this up with financial plans, management reporting, which goes to the Finance Council, as Trish mentioned, balance sheets and profit and loss statements and cash flows and, you know, pro formas in terms of where we're going, what are we trying to achieve. And once again, we're trying to push, you're going to see in a minute, we're trying to push the bar out at least three years on all of our schools. So some of the things that we're using in the schools is, you know, a per pupil cost financing strategy where we have schools look at how are they financing themselves today. So that we obviously help them with the budget and the prioritization. And then we use a financial dashboard. And then we have a multi-year planning approach, which is a flexible budget, which allows schools to look at what are the various enrollment scenarios that they have available to them as they look at what their fixed and variable costs are, or what they need to do to go up another 25 students, they can look at where do they need to make those investments. Or if you start to look at over multiple years, do I need to invest in curriculum or iPads or plant and facilities or additional staffing component or, or more wages for our staff, we actually work a flexible budget approach that we can have parishes and schools start to stretch towards investing areas of what they need going forward. We've developed a multi-year template where we provided every one of our schools with three years of their financial actuals of their balance sheet, as well as all their profit and loss activity. And it also summarizes their per pupil cost percentage on all of those line items, as well as what is their per pupil cost. And then it allows them as they build some of the assumptions to look at how they're financing some themselves so they can look at trend analysis, which ultimately forces them back to say, what do I need to do in the present to build a sustainable future. Okay. So I'm just going to walk through. These are some of the tools I mentioned earlier that we have available that I'm going to show you some of the tools we have available for our schools. So we have an academic dashboard, a financial dashboard, um, and I'm going to demonstrate just briefly some of the flexible budget approaches and the multi-year planning tools so you have a sense of what we, we're trying to do with schools. So we work with schools on budget preparation areas. On the left side, those are some of the major components so that we have forms, procedures, and schedules on staffing and benefit plans and how to plan a budget, how to look at revenue, how to look at office and facility and instructional costs. And so we build a line item budget for all of our schools and we work with them accordingly. On the right hand side, we've also educated our schools on different types of budgeting that can take place. So for some parishes that don't really go through an extensive budgeting process, you can actually do something in the yellow circle they are called incremental budgeting, which takes the budget and adds an inflation factor. That's not the way to go. Because what it does is it inflates all of your revenues and it inflates all of your expenses 
but it masks all the prioritization. And it usually ends up with across the board reductions or cuts and it really once again doesn't have you look at true resource allocation around mission and program. A zero based approach kind of looks at you know looking at everything from zero and so as you put together the collaboratives you actually have an opportunity to look at the history of what's been the parish structures as they are look to see some of the things you'd like to see change in the future. What are some of the resources that might be available? What are some of the one-time income sources that were there last year that may no longer be there this year? What are some of the things that might be available next year that we can think about so that we can find ways to create new revenues and uh, new expense areas? So we, we also, so the line item budget and the functional budget, the line item budget is really what you see now through your QuickBooks reports where you see all the revenues and expenses and a functional budget really classifies those revenue and expenses into categories, compensation, benefits, and office supplies, etc. And so I'm going to demonstrate the flexible budget and how we've used the flexible budget in combination with some of all of those budgeting types to help our schools. The concept we did a few years ago is we created a financial task force with the public consulting group that went out to all of our parish schools and interviewed every single one of them. I provided three years of financial data for all the schools and we came back with a way to build a financial dashboard. So that the dashboard was not a report card, but it was actually a tool that would be given to schools to have them start to learn key metrics and trends to manage their budget and their actuals. So that we came up with a concept of net tuition revenue, which for the accountants in the room is gross billings less the discounts and aid. And we set a benchmark, it's a high benchmark of 85% of per pupil cost. Schools that are over that mark are all financially profitable, generate profit margins from operations and are able to put money towards capital improvements, investments in the plant and facility, or towards building up the balance sheet. So for some of our urban schools, that number ranges from about 60 to 75%. It, it could be anywhere in that range. So that we have some debates in terms of, you know, if that's a high percentage, a low percentage, but as I'm going to show in a minute, at the end of the day, you have to, at a minimum, fund 100% of your per pupil cost and your total budget. So if you're at a 60-40, you know, you still have to raise the other 40% that's non-tuition revenue from other sources, and you have to question where does that come from. So we look at revenue enhancement, growth, and we work with our schools to seek recurring and consistent income sources of how they fund the operation. So the, the one-time gifts are obviously needed and wanted, but we can't base a budget off them or expecting donors to provide those sums of money every year. So we have to find ways that we work with our schools on school auxiliary income, extended day programs, how do we price, how do we look at profit margins. We look at enrollment management, retention strategies, growth strategies. We do capacity analysis in terms of average class size, the number of grade offerings in their building. Um, we are actually looking at the balance sheet in terms of we'd like to see every school have two to three months of operating cash on hand. That can be a high number for some, but we have some that have exceeded that. So we measure days cash in hand, which means that how many days could the school continue to operate if no additional dollars came in? So if you looked at two to three months, you'd be looking at about 90 days. So, you know, once again, this is just basic cash flow. So when you look at long-term working capital and short-term working, ca working capital in a school with roughly, if your school was a $3.6 million operation, one month would be $300,000 on hand. That's one month of bills. So when you start thinking of the, you know, 80% of the cost of a school is salary and benefits, and those numbers actually occur every single month. So it's a, a lot of money exchanges through the school on a day-to-day -day basis. And once again, we looked and worked with our schools on looking at the profit margins on net fundraising programs, before and after school programs, the school auxiliary, um, and we measure that inverse of the per pupil cost. So some of our great debates come up with our schools in terms of, you know, Jim, there's no way I can get 85% of net tuition revenue from my families. So if you look at this pie as 100% of your cost at a minimum, if the big slice of that pie was net tuition revenue, then the other, we well, have to look at what are the other available sources available to the school. So you'd have net fundraising, you'd have a school auxiliary income, which would be cafeteria programs, extended day programs, summer camps, um, but there's limitations. 
and then support and subsidies, which could be the school tax, some of the parish support. We still have bingo operating in some of the schools. So, but once again, we identify what percentage of cost are those income sources covering, and we work with schools on how they re-strategize so they don't continue to go forward being vulnerable with variable income sources. You have to, once again, find permanent ways to support. So once again, thinking of how do you finance it from 100%, that visual kind of helps people put in line. If it's 85-15 or 70-30 or 75-25, the task is where does the supplemental income come from to fund the tuition differential? So once again, a, a flexible budget. We have scenarios that we plan and we give all of our schools. We have schools planned from a pessimistic budget perspective, an achievable budget perspective, and an optimistic perspective. And we have them look at their enrollment and they actually put enrollment, so if you had 300, 350, and 400, you'd have to say, okay, we're at 350, we think that's safe. What would, it what would happen for us to get to 400? Would we have to open another classroom? We'd have to add more in staffing. What's the fixed and variable cost component? So once again, we do some of that flux analysis with schools, but more importantly, we want them to understand they have to have some stretch goals, but they have to have a management plan that's conservative and will gradually move them finding the money they need before they just act and they have to look at some of the indicators and the assumptions behind. So once again, we look at the gross tuition and fees billed, the financial aid. We try to look at how do schools raise scholarship money. So if your school, for example, is giving away a lot of money in financial aid and discounts, the question you want to ask is how are we funding those resources? So if you, there's no question we need financial aid and resources, especially as we increase price and tuition, but we have to have permanent sources of income of how do we fund it. So once again, when you can build the strategy, schools have been able to kind of build that multi-year plan. And then obviously, we um, trend out the salaries, the benefits, the office administrative, and then down below the non-operating items for capital and depreciation or debt service. We work with schools on how the operation of the school could contribute towards a capital depreciation fund, financing a certain provision of capital every year, or financing some debt service on a managed plan. I'm not going to go through this, but this is the school financial dashboard that we have for all of our schools. So it has three years of financial history, it charts in revenue, enrollment trends, the revenue and expense, the net tuition revenue, and it kind of, it scores five categories down below, highest being three, lowest being zero. So that we don't see it as a report card or a demerit slip, we work with schools to understand their metrics. Um, so it's been a very helpful tool, once again, building on the concepts that I just articulated. We have a multi-year financial template, which is Excel-based. We actually, we provided this full of three years of financial history to every school. We left areas for them to build their 13 actuals, their 14 budget, their 15 budget. But it also it does, it puts all, the, all of their financials in proper accounting order. So it, it, it exemplifies gap-based reporting, generally accepted accounting principles in terms of how you should look at tuition, how you should look at how you finance auxiliary income, how you should look at um, unrealized gains and losses, non-operating components. So once again, we constantly try to work with our schools to do things in the proper way in terms of how it would look on an audit or for regular management planning, or if those financials were gonna go to a bank. We want them to do things appropriately. And then lastly, we had created a, a multi-year planning dashboard, which looks similar to the financial dashboard, but each one of those pink areas are actually blank fields. I filled them in here, but a school can actually go in once they complete their multi-year template, and they can go in and build in assumptions, and they can trend three years out, looking at, well, if our enrollment was 225, and what if it could go to 250, what would it look like? Or what would our net tuition revenue look like if we priced it at X? Or what, what, if we had to do a 5% increase on revenue enhancement, how would we increase our revenue and where would that money come from? And it actually allows the school to actually do right hands-on assumptions and analysis and trend analysis so they can actually look to see are these things achievable. Now some of these things, to me it's the multi-year plan is the most important tool because if we look at what colleges do really well, colleges plan over 10-year periods. 
and they put a so-called stake in the ground and they put out assumptions of where they'd like to be. So we're asking for a three or a five year view and I'd encourage you to do the same. But if you put out the metrics and you put out what you'd like, where you'd like to be, you may end up tossing out some of the numbers and say, well, we can't do that. But some of those things are, are things you're gonna need to do and what you have to do is create the plan and the vision. And when you create the plan and the vision, that's where money comes from, that's where resources are allocated to, that's where donors step up in today's society. People don't want to just write a check, they want to see what are they investing in, do you have a plan, do you know where you're going? So once again, all of the fiscal tools around the missionary tools, around the multi-year planning tools, the mission statement, everything that we do actually does come together in terms of who we are as church because we are a donation-based system. And we, that's where we began and we still are very much reliant on the generosity of benefactors and donors and parishioners to help us carry out our mission. And lastly, I'll just close with a quote from our, our Cardinal and um, in terms of his vision for Catholic education and obviously it's a major priority of his uh, and he has put significant investments uh, to help us continue our efforts in this regard. So I hope I didn't go too long and I'm available for any questions if uh, you have any. Yes. Oh. Wow. <laughs> You can't go around the individual school board to make a similar presentation of give them the opportunity to, to look at this and be more aware of it. Well, pretty much everything, um, aside from some, there's a few things that schools don't have, but all the planning tools that you have in that document, all of our schools already have available and we've already made available to them. Um, we will be working with our school advisory boards in the coming year. So our strategic plan in the Catholic School Office for the Cardinal is to try to have an advisory board up and running in every school so that we are doing two things. One is we're doing workshops like this. The second thing we're doing is we actually have board workshops that we've partnered with Boston College and the Catholic School Foundation. We have a series of workshops that are actually starting in October so that we actually have those happening on a higher level as well for all of our boards. And that would in both for the separately incorporated entities as well as for parish advisory boards. Yeah. We're gonna, we always keep that at the forefront to look, you know, down the line if we'd ever be, you know, vouchers or tax credits or things that might be available to us so that, we, you know, we do look for those things down the line that have happened in other dioceses and other parts of the United States. Um, right now, we, the only money we get from the federal government is for Title I funding, which is a matter of um, application from our families in, in need. But all, all good points. I mean, it, I didn't put out any numbers of how many people should be on a school board yet because we're still kind of pioneering those things with the parishes and the pastoral councils. And you can always start small and build up. 